Hey everyone, welcome to Queerly Recommended, the podcast where we recommend queer films, books, TV shows, and more. I'm Tara Scott, and I review sapphic fiction, the lesbian review, and smart bitches, trashy books. And I know it's been a little while, but this week I am recommending a sapphic romance novel that was released earlier this year. And I'm Chris Bryant, a contemporary romance writer for Bold Strokes Books. And this week I'm recommending not one, but two documentaries. So, as always, we just want to take a minute to thank everyone who supports us, whether it's through our coffee, signing up for a newsletter. We do have links to both in our show notes. Also want to just take a moment to specifically thank Dana, who supported us through coffee with this message saying, love your conversations. They're wise, witty, happy, filled with love for queerness. Thank you. That is so sweet. And we do love it. Speaking of coffee in our newsletter, mostly of our newsletter, we're going to do something new. (laughs) Maybe when this drops, you'll notice today, or if I can't get my shit together this weekend, (laughs) uh, maybe it will be soon. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a little busy right now, but we've been talking about it. And actually, somebody who subscribes to our newsletter made a suggestion that I think ended up being a really good one. Actually, she's one of my former bosses. I love her so much. She's awesome. I'm kind of surprised because I can see sometimes who subscribers are. And some of them are like my coworkers and my former boss. And uh, something <laughs> that she sweet. suggested was, why don't you do it on Substack? And then I went out for dinner with some of my old coworkers, one of whom happens to subscribe. And I was like, hey, I want to get your take on that. And she said, heck yeah, you should absolutely go on Substack because then you can actually embed videos. We can embed, like there was a newsletter recently where I linked to a playlist. She said, you can embed the playlist in yeah. there so that people using the Substack app can actually just engage with the stuff right there within. And I thought, well, that's a great idea. So we're going to switch the newsletter to Substack. All of the content, as far as we know for now anyway, like all the main content is always going to be free. The newsletter will always be free. Access to the podcast will always be free. That is something we are absolutely committed to. We will have paid tiers. If you're inclined to support us, there is absolutely not an obligation. We know times are tough for a lot of people. But we might come up with some kind of bonus content that might be available at higher tiers. We don't know what that looks like yet. But if there's anything that you are dying to see that you think might actually be worth a little extra for, let us know. We're down for ideas all the time. Mm -hmm. I had a great idea. So maybe that'll that'll happen. Yes, you do have a great idea. I did. I just got to figure out the logistics. I know. And if we can make that (laughs) as a promise. (laughs) But even by having it on Substack too, the thing that I'm excited about is like, maybe we can open, start opening up some community conversations, even just asking, like, I would love to know what everybody else is reading and watching and loving. So I think that gives us opportunities that using the kind of more traditional newsletter format and provider we've been using doesn't have. So stay tuned for that. So excited to evolve the newsletter with all of you so that we can make it maybe more of a community vibe and bring more of you into what we're doing. Speaking of communities. Yes. Chris, you went to Women's Week. I did. All right. Update from the field. Can you give us an update from the field? What was Women's Week 2023 like? So Women's Week was and always is a blast. Can I say blast? Is that even cool anymore? It was lit. It was you're on asking, fire. You're asking me what's cool? <laughs> oh my God. We're in trouble. Yeah. What are the young kids saying these days? Um, actually, it was a lot of fun and it was great to see my friends again. And I got to meet new readers. We had, uh, yeah, it was, it was, I think Ruth said that, that we had like probably half as many new re- or half, twice as many, or how do I want to say this? My math is off. It's Sunday. 50% more new readers? Was it that? Yeah, because it, it's not necessarily more. It's just different readers, like new to us oh, readers. Oh, cool. Well, but, hey, new to us readers. Yeah, exactly. So that was really cool. And so I spent a lot of the time before the the panels that we had. So the, so the panels for Bold Strokes Books happens at the library. And so basically there's a panel and then there's a 10-minute break from the next panel to get set up. 
And during that time, you can buy books. We have books over to the side. And so I spent that time at the table selling books. Like that was my mm. shtick. I like, I like sold everybody's books. Like that was mm -hmm. my thing. I sold out of my book. So that was amazing. Yay! Yeah. So that's, that's what I did all week. And it was funny because I actually, uh, I bought Rad's book so that uh, she could sign it. And I normally don't do that. I don't, I don't know why I don't. Is it because she's your boss? <laughs> yeah. And maybe that's it. I don't know. I just felt like that was, it was a book that she actually wrote a book with Julie Cannon, but that's not the book I got. I got mm -hmm. another book from her and I had her sign it. And she looked at me and she's like, she goes, would you like me to sign it to Chris Diva? Or, and there was another <laughs> name she gave me and I forgot what it was. And I just laughed oh so God. hard. It was so funny. And I'm like, please all three. But it was, it was, it was very complimentary because she's like, thank yeah. you for, you know, doing all that you do. Cause I was up there trying to sell the books for everybody. And, mm -hmm. and it was really nice. I met this uh, one reader. It was funny because uh, some of the books that I was recommending, they were out of, they sold out of BSB sold out of. And so oh, I'm like, you cool. know what, I'm going to go down to women's crafts because Michelle has a lot of books and BSB only had our most recent books, you know, for the mm -hmm. year. And I think mm -hmm. usually one, maybe two of each author. But Women's Crafts always has BSB books and they have a lot of the backlists. So yeah. I took uh, I took this uh, super sweet new reader, Taylor, down there and uh, we signed books and sold books there too. Because <laughs> I was like, oh I don't, my goodness. Yeah. I know. I was like, I'm here to sell books. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to meet some readers. And I did. And it was just, it was a lot of fun. We had a really good time. And I got to see a lot of my uh, my patrons from Patreon. Um, yeah, that I was heard you great. Met a couple of listeners too. I did. I met some listeners who uh, just said, "Look, we listen to the show. We listen to the podcast. It's great. Keep doing what you're doing." And it just it just warmed my heart. It was just such a good time. It's like, and it you know, P Town is super hard to get to. I know it's expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, because you have to travel there and then you have to, the places are always very expensive because they're on the ocean uh, yeah. or on the Cape. And it's just an expensive place to be. But it is worth it if you really want to get uh, close and personal with a lot of the uh, Bold Strokes books and the Bywater writers. That's the mm -hmm. place to go. Do Bella authors tend to go to that one or is that kind of less so? Like every, I know everybody goes to GCLS. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the like, without fail, you can meet people from all the companies there. And then like regional sort of depends right. on which authors are close. We get a lot of indies um, mm -hmm. in P-Town. A lot of indies are there. And it's just a it's just a really relaxed vibe because you're there for a long time. I mean, you are yeah. there at GCLS too, but GCLS has like panels. It's very structured. Whereas Women's Week, are, you know, it's like you get down with a panel and you're talking to somebody, you're like, hey, I'm done. I'm going to go get lunch. Do you want to go too? And they're like, sure. And you know, it's very casual, very laid back. Yeah. Uh, plus, it's the ocean every time. Like, mm -hmm. and for this landlocked baby right here, you know, I need to see yes. that ocean. <laughs> so, uh, so I love it for that. And it's just, you know, it's just, it's our comfort. It's my comfort place. So mm -hmm. I know that, you know, GCLS bounces around different places. And it's always unsettling when you go to a city that you've never been to before. There's always that level mm -hmm. of awareness, of heightened awareness, you know, where you are, where do I need to be, you know, where should I be, where do I need to go to? Whereas P-Town, it's always the same. You know, you yeah. can go down any any of the streets, Bradford Commercial, and you know that there's going to be, oh, somebody at the Squealing Pig or, yeah. you know, the Blue Monkey. Or the, it's just It's just so much fun and I really enjoy it. And I think that if you can't afford it, you know, definitely at least try to go to uh, Women's Week at least one time. So good. Well, yeah. I won't do it next year because I did promise you that I would go to GCLS next yes. year. Yes. And I'm going to do <laughs> it. So for people that are trying to figure out where they're going next year, if that is important information to you, that's yes. where I'm planning on being. And we were asked, I don't know, can we talk about it? Hmm. We were perhaps it perhaps has been suggested. No details have been nailed down. <laughs> um, that we might be able to do something pretty damn cool at GCLS next there year. There you go. Yes. And <laughs> so again, no promises. We have to like work stuff out, but maybe just uh, get a little bit excited. And when we do have more details, we'll share them. Right. You're so good at this. I'm like, it's because yeah. I, I work in marketing in my day. <laughs> right. And I'm like, I, yeah, I'm like directed to the excited. point. <laughs> I am excited. I am for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so I had my fun, but it's, uh, maybe you're going to have some fun coming up. 
what's going so, on in your life? Work related, but in a week, I am going to my first conference. It might actually be first conference ever, like for a professional one that I have to go to like work as part of the staff, but that we're not throwing because at my last <laughs> company, I used to go to the annual conference, but like we threw the conference. So I was mm. kind of working it from that. And I realized this is so like, I find this kind of hilarious because I'm middle age, right? Like this has been said Come before. Come on, you're That's a baby. That's just a thing. I'm a baby. <laughs> I'm a baby middle ager. But I had to turn to my best friend. How lucky am I that my high school best friend lives here and she's still one of my best friends. She moved to the same city I moved to. Wow. And I was like, hey, can you take <laughs> me shopping? I need grown up clothes because I worked at a B2B tech company before. And I don't know if you know this, but like B2B tech conference wear is like blazer, t-shirt, jeans, sneakers. <laughs> it was like, oh no, I have to go to like a grown up professional conference. Ugh. What do people even wear to these? Like I work from home now. Like I think we all know pandemic wardrobe is like sweatshirt and, and or sorry, I mean, like sweatpants, <laughs> hoodies, t-shirts. Yeah, right. I have tons of that and like I'm very good at what I do for work and I'm very professional and how I get it all done but like I don't have grown-up conference wear so my friend bless her we show up at the mall <laughs> and I said okay look I don't have like a strong vision for what I want but I want to feel good when I look in the mirror and I know that I feel good when I tend to dress more androgynous and she was like oh no 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 I have a vision. You're going to have one monochromatic look. You're going to have a color look. And you're going to, we, Chris, you wouldn't believe this. Wow. Cause I know you're not a huge fan of shopping either, right? I fucking love it. Do you like I going love clothes it. shopping? I love it. Okay. I totally misread you. I don't love clothes <laughs> shopping. <laughs> I That's on love me. it. Two stores and we were done. We were having lunch in less than an hour. Wow. She is the queen she knew what was up she was pulling stuff on the rack and i was trying it on and all but one clothing item fit i didn't know what size i was because i've lost like 10 15 pounds and my body is shifting with the workouts i've been doing like sorry i mean like my body composition has been shifting (laughs) and so i was like i don't even know she's like here try this on i was like oh my god this one suit that i have i look like such a boss bitch love it I'm very pictures, excited. photos. I will definitely send you pictures. <laughs> I want to um, see them. So that's kind of my, that's what I have going on. I'm excited to just like go out and experience just like a normal work conference and learn a lot and meet a bunch of people. Right. And, Where and you actually, don't have to stress about the conference itself. You can actually go and have a good yeah. time and not worry about, oh, did this go off right? Or is this? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yes, I have a bunch of things that I need to do as part of representing my company, but I'm also excited because I work at a company that's all remote. And so there's a few of my coworkers I've met in person because they live in the same city as me, but I'm actually going to get to meet some of my coworkers in person for the first time. And they all just seem so lovely. I spend so much time with them on Zoom, but like, I'm going to hug them. Not all, well, consensually. I'm going to consensually hug my coworkers. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's going to be fun when we finally meet for the first time. I feel like right now, like, like right now, like our Mm -hmm. pictures right now is a true depiction, like actual size. I feel like, (laughs) (laughs) I feel like, you know, you're this tiny little thing. Well, how tall are you? You are closer to your camera than I am to mine. (laughs) First of all, my, I do not have a head that tiny. (laughs) (laughs) You're like a little super tiny. Uh, I'm five, five. All right, you are taller than me, but you're like four inches taller than me. Oh, stop it. You're five foot. Don't even try this five foot one. No, I am five foot one. Are you five foot one? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, no, for real. Oh, well, I think technically I'm five foot one and a half, but like who's kidding anyone with this half bullshit? I just say I'm five one. I think, I think. Yeah, it's like age. I'm eight and three quarters. <laughs> yeah, right. I think like, people who who are you know like right at five foot or real close add everything that they possibly can. Listen, yeah. I'm going to show up in my Doc Martin boots, and I'm going to be two inches taller than I am now. So I'm going to be tall, and like everybody, all the readers mm-hmm. and all the writers are going to be super tall. I'm like okay I'm always that. surprised how tall Melissa Braden is every time I see her. How tall is she? I forget that she's taller than I am. 
yeah it's just like a couple inches taller be... than me look i think i just need to hang out with ray spangler who i know is also <laughs> a little peanut right um sweet peanut they recently said something on facebook about always feeling like bro vibes with me and i was like yeah that feels right all right so chris yes. what have you been watching lately because i think you're too busy writing to be reading no so here's the deal i'm still really far behind on my book i gave myself a deadline that i have to really start focusing starting november 1st i have to bang this book out i have a feeling i'm gonna have to push it and mm-hmm. I have a feeling I'm only going to have one book next year. But there's been too much going on in my life for me to yeah. spare the time to write. Um, mm-hmm. And it's unfortunate, but I think it's I think it's a must. I I just I just yeah. I don't know. Like I turned in Dreamer, and that actually I have to do page proofs for. They came mm-hmm. in last night, so I have to go and do page proofs. And I feel like if I had another month, that book would have been amazing. Yeah. You know, it's one of those where I don't want to keep rushing things because I have all these these deadlines that used to work for me years mm-hmm. ago before, you know, I got promoted and things like that. And, yeah. um, you know, my day job. So I have to figure out like what's, you know, where what's important right now. So, yeah, I'm still trying to find my footing at this new position and that pays the bills right now. So writing might yeah. have to go down to instead of three books a year, it might have to go down to like one and a novella or something. But I like, gotta figure out something. Speaking from the reader perspective, I can't I can't speak for all of your readers, but I can say as a reader, I would personally prefer to have like one truly excellent book a year mm-hmm. than like an author say, I did three books and I feel lukewarm about all of them because I didn't give them the love and attention. Like right. one book that knocks my socks off, you know, I'm gonna be talking about that book for the next six months. That's just like how it goes so yeah i think that's cool and like there's different seasons for different things in life yeah like so i'm uh yeah so anyway i should be writing but i'm not because i just found out Mm -hmm. because i have been gone and other things have been going on in my life i just found out that the great british baking show is back on netflix so i got to binge is it still paul and peru or the judges yes yes And, and who are the hosts? Oh, I knew you were going to ask me that. And I is was hoping. Is it still those they... two guys? Is, is it no. still Matt and. Oh. No, 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 no. So I'm stalling because I'm going to pull it up. But I was actually um, a couple weeks behind. So it was nice because I got to binge like three or four episodes. When I, when I first saw it, so I was like, good. it was a super loud gasp. Like, oh, it's back on. It's my comfort mm. show. Okay. The Great British Baking Show. Actually. I'm waiting for it to finish, but the Great Canadian Baking Show has started up again. Oh, nice. But I think what I'm going to do is once I hear the last episode, because I get impatient and I don't want, even for the gentlest show on television, which is the Great Canadian Baking Show, (laughs) like I would rather have it so that if I have a migrainey weekend, which, you know, happens like once a month or so, Mm -hmm. I'd love to be able to just like lay down with that show and just watch the whole thing kind of in one shot or in two days Mm. yeah yeah i like i like the binge i like the binge i I can't find Mm -hmm. it i can't do two things at once okay but But, uh, okay so they switched up the host they switched up the host the not well i guess yeah the host yeah they just switch it up but it's still fun a lot of fun and they have a hearing impaired person and they have a uh, interpreter now and so they interpret the whole entire time. It's amazing. Oh my goodness. That's yeah. so good. And I love her too. Her name is Tasha. And okay. she's an amazing baker and she's just adorable. And I just, I want to be friends with her. Is that she's who you're rooting so for? Sweet. I am. I'm, I'm rooting for her. And uh-huh. there's also a baker from originally from Sri Lanka. And she is mm-hmm. hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. And they really like her too, but I don't think she's going to go very far. But I think Tasha has has a good shot at it. And there's this what like they just had this amazing showstoppers. It was like pies, pie week. We call pie. They call it something else. You know how they call cookies, biscuits and yeah, pastries. You know, I don't know what this is, but it was pie week. And this and your showstopper, this guy did like a um, a flower pot and it was like sunflowers. He made them out of uh, everything was made out of pies. Like the leaves oh were pies. Goodness. It was amazing. And I'm like, and he didn't even win the showstopper. Like he wasn't the winner. Some, uh, another woman did. She did an amazing job too. So it was, 
it was very, very cool. So I'm, I just, that's, that's my comfort place. Like great British, the great British baking show is, it's just my comfort. Mm -hmm. Like, I love it. I was so excited. I can binge that all day, every day. So I've been watching that. And then, so, you know, because since the, we're still not really discussing struck work, Mm -hmm. I actually watched the Beckham documentary on Netflix. Was that good? You know, I know nothing of Beckham other than, you know, from like several years ago, I knew he was a great soccer player, but I don't oh, yeah. follow soccer at all. And I knew and he that, married a Spice Girl and, and all he's that like stuff. Super hot or like a lot of yeah, a lot yeah. of people think he's super hot. That was the right. main thing. It was like, I knew he was an incredible soccer player and mm-hmm. he's done some modeling mm-hmm. and but he married a Spice you, Girl and they had like four or five kids. I absolutely love him now after watching that like that documentary did such a good job of explaining who he is where he Mm -hmm. came from his family life and to me you know soccer football whatever you want to call it Mm -hmm. soccer was life for him you know he didn't have a lot of friends Mm -hmm. uh his dad really pushed soccer and he like joined like a major soccer team when he was a teenager like oh it was, goodness. yeah, I know. And it was like, I think he played his first professional game when he was 17, but they cited him when he was like 13 or 15 or something like that. Yeah. It was insane. And like, just his story was just, it was so unbelievably sweet. Like you look at him and you think, yeah, all those cocky things like, oh, he's good yeah. looking. He's a bottle. He like hangs out with the, but you know what? Ultimately all he wanted was, you know, he, since he didn't have a lot of friends, he just wanted love. And he found Aww. it in Victoria and it was really sweet. He, he you know, she, her side of the story and his side of the story, you know, she, she said he would drive four hours just, just to spend seven minutes with me when they first started dating. Come on. Yeah. It was so it, like the romantic in me just melted. I melted listening to his story, you okay. know, and it was just, and the bad thing, the only bad thing and I, not about him but to him like he's mm-hmm. had some real shitty managers like his managers yeah. were just jerks like the whole time yeah. like it was really really bad and he had just such a degree of professionalism and mm-hmm. like nobody really had anything bad to say about him he was just you know family wow. man and even now watching him now like mm-hmm. and he's a clean he's a cleany like everything even when he was a kid he, everything had to be in its place like they interviewed him and he and they have so many interviews from when like he was a baby not a baby but like a toddler they have videos of him yeah. when he was a toddler playing soccer and through his whole life you know they have videos uh of like games when he was 8 10 years old and then when he went professional they had like like his whole story was fascinating it's a four part series on Netflix and i i do recommend it i just i wish it was queer but i mean it wasn't yeah. and but still, it was a, it was an amazing story. And I love, like, okay, so here's something that was kind of cool. Like, mm-hmm. he and Victoria both are like, you know, be who you want to be. Love who you want to love. I mean, mm-hmm. they they just seemed like really cool people. And especially him. Like, I would totally be friends with him. Yeah. That's so, amazing. Yeah. Okay, that and sounds he, awesome. And yeah. Worth checking I, out. For sure. I could keep talking about it, but I know we have we have a, a whole entire podcast to get through. So. <laughs> So yes, and then of course Survivor's back on, and yeah. Survivor's always queer. I love it. They always have somebody queer, at least one or two. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's kind of fun to see, like people struggle. It's fun to see people struggle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, people who put themselves in this position, and you see them struggle, and you're just kind of laughing because I'm sure it's hard. But fucking nothing beats alone Australia. Like that wrapped up. I finished yeah. it. I finished yeah. it. So, uh, yeah, I finished it over the weekend. Are you happy and with who won? I am. Yes, I am happy with who won. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like you're going to go through the same things I did when you went through this, when you go yeah, through this you season. you can't even, it's so funny, I, the way you talk about it, usually you're like, I'm going to do it in ways so it's not spoilery, but you're not going to watch it, so I'll give, give a little more detail. But now that I'm watching, <laughs> like, you can't even give that much. I know. I'm just saying, like, I love that you're going to go through the exact same thing I did. Mm-hmm. Like you're gonna watch it going, why would anybody fucking go there? Oh my god. This place is the worst. Yeah. I mean, it is the worst place. I think, well, I'm not the worst place on earth, but it's pretty damn close to actually, you know, try to Mm -hmm. try to survive there. And the things that people eat. (laughs) I'm not fucking eating that. It's not happening. Yeah, it's not Mm -hmm. happening. 
Mm-hmm. So yes. So uh, yeah, that's what I've been watching. What about you? What have you been reading or watching? Okay. So sticking with Alone, I finished season two and it turns out that for two seasons in a row, uh, when I would text you like, I think I like this guy, that's who ends up winning. <laughs> Good for so you. <laughs> I'm like, maybe I'm just really great at predicting this. I don't know. Um, we'll find out. We'll find out. I, <laughs> yeah, I was actually quite pleased with who won the second season totally thought he deserved it and then i started watching season three and they switched locations because the first two were in the same place in yeah at the top of vancouver island off the coast of british columbia and then i was glad they switched locations because it was definitely starting to feel a little too samey for me but mm-hmm. now it's in patagonia and they were talking about the 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 risks there mm-hmm. uh, mainly the animals and they were like yeah there's like pumas and what were they and they were like <laughs> wild like warthogs or something like giant <laughs> hogs and i was like what the fuck and i actually texted you i was like that's when i would nope out immediately i'm nope. saying like i'm watching it and they said that and i literally said it out loud i was like nope like, nope nope <laughs> like 600 pound pigs with tusks that charge and will murder you absolutely not i don't know how <laughs> these people do it i'm only <laughs> in the first because they do like the intro episode and then they do the first real episode i consider it oh yeah i mean mm-hmm. I'm in the middle of the first real episode so far. I like most of the people though. Like it's an mm-hmm. interesting cast and I'm curious to see how it goes. So yeah, I'm really glad I started joining you on this. Yay. Journey. It's just, it's fun. It's, it's fun f- to watch. And because why would people willingly do this? And everybody well, thinks they're going to survive. Like everybody, mm-hmm. oh, I can do this. I, you know, I, yeah. I hunt game in Alabama and I can like mm-hmm. shoot an arrow, blah, blah, blah. And, and it's just, it cracks me up. It's like, you're not yeah. that good. I, no. I, I'm a shit ton better than I am, but I for no. sure would never say, hey, like I will survive the apocalypse, but mm-hmm. it's not going to be smooth. <laughs> no, it's not going to be pretty for no. most of us. <laughs> uh, so there's that. I'm still watching Drag Race UK, but like we're recording this on a Sunday. It released the last episode on Thursday and I totally forgot. I actually oh. forgot until I cracked open. We have an outline that we put together for every episode. And I was like, oh, yeah, there is Drag Race mm-hmm. UK on TV. So uh, unfortunately, I wonder if that kind of says it all. Like, it's fine. There are very talented queens this season. But I wonder if, like, my ADHD hyperfixation has finally chilled out about RuPaul's Drag Race after, like, two literal years. <laughs> so we'll see. I'm going to keep going with it. The next one, yeah. I've been ex- so excited to tell oh! you. It might only be available in Canada, and I'm not done yet, but I'm really enjoying it. It is a comedy docu series, <laughs> so it is a documentary series, absolutely. So it's not, you know, this is not struck work that I'm covering, but it's called "I Have Nothing." It's Canadian <laughs> made. It's on. I've been watching it on Crave in Canada, and it has an improv comedian she well she also does stand up and she's a part of a sketch comedy show that was quite popular here called baroness von sketch if you ever have the opportunity to watch it it's very very funny it's it's a four women crew that does that show and carolyn is the she's actually the lesbian of the crew and she it starts with her and also like may martin is one of her, her very good friends and is a part of it and talks about how in her stand-up show she would have this bit where she talked about how she would be driving along and whitney do you remember whitney houston's song i have nothing it was like such Uh a popular song (laughs) right and that song would come on and in her mind she could picture an olympic level professional figure skating routine and this is the six-part docuseries about her quest to get this song <laughs> turned into an Olympic level professional love it. figure skating routine with like her choreographing it. I think it's safe to say who actually go, like, I don't think it's that big of a spoiler to say who it is that ends up performing it because they've been doing the promo too. Do you remember a Katerina Gordieva? She was a pair skater with her husband, Sergei Grinkov, and he died. Oh, he was like 28. Yeah. He was like 28. He had a heart attack or like something happened with his heart. And so it was this big deal. Like she wrote a book about him and all that, but it's her and her current husband, David Pelletier, who was also a Paris figure skater for Canada. Mm. I was obsessed. 
obsessed with her when I was in high school. <laughs> really? I'm looking her up now. But, like, I was obsessed with the two of them because like when I was in high school, I loved figure skating. That was my thing that I would always watch at the Olympics. That was when it was like mm-hmm. Christy Yamaguchi and oh, yeah. Nancy Kerrigan and like that kind of era was when like figure skating was so fucking cool. And so like I'm watching this and it was just this like surreal. What is happening? I love this so much. I have no excuse for why I haven't finished it yet. Other than I started watching season three of Alone. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I will finish it. Mm -hmm. But it's such a wild premise. And it's such like it feels like such a weirdly specific premise. And I actually think that's what makes this series sing. And one of the things I really appreciate about it is that, you know, as Carolyn is going about doing this, they don't only show the good sides of her. They actually also show when she's being extremely difficult with her team. Mm -hmm. And I like that they show some of those like not awesome moments because it's a reminder that like, yeah, as we're going about a goal, we're not always great to the people around us. Like it's Mm -hmm. really hard. It can test who you like to present to the world most of the time. And you get to hear the song, I Have Nothing, quite a lot, of course. Because... <laughs> yeah, I'll be singing it all night. <laughs> uh-huh. And then related, I just want to give a real short plug, not that they need it, but for the Handsome Podcast. Like I said, Mae Martin is in I Have Nothing. Mae Martin is also one of the three hosts of the Handsome Podcast with Tig Notaro and Fortune Feimster. Mm. So extremely, extremely queer podcast. And it's just like them shooting the shit for most of it. But each episode, there's a clip of some other celebrity asking them a question. And then they all discuss. And it's usually somebody that like one of them is working with. And so, for example, I think one of my favorites so far was Lance Bass, Mm. um, who is Fortune Feimster's friends with, asked, would you rather have one full-sized clone of yourself or would you rather have five half-sized clones of yourself? (laughs) (laughs) Full-size. That's a good full-size. Ridiculous, right? But sometimes the questions are serious. Like... Keenan Thompson asked, when do they think the U.S. will get a female president? Mm. Do you think it'll be like this time or this time? And mm. that led to a super interesting conversation. I love it. I find the show, it's so fun. Their banter is so good. So like, if you're looking for another queer podcast, hell yeah. Handsome Pod is where it's at. It is definitely my jam right now. Nice. That sounds awesome. So Chris. Yes. What is your official recommendation this week? So my official recommendation is actually two documentaries. Both are about Amy Winehouse. Back to Black and Reclaiming Amy. So I'm back on the musician train Mm -hmm. because of the whole struck work thing. Um, And it took me three documentaries until I found the one where they talk about her bisexuality. Mm -hmm. So I knew, I knew like at the time, you know, we kind of knew Amy Winehouse because of her big breakout song, you know, yeah. Rehab. Yeah. So I thought, well, I'm pretty sure she's, she, there's something I read at some point that she is queer. So I'm like, okay, I will go ahead and learn everything I want to learn about Amy Winehouse. Because I always mm-hmm. like to see a musician's journey to where they yeah. get, you know, because we have so many musicians in this world and, you know, only a certain amount are going to make it. You know, and we have people who are way more talented than the people who are successful, but Mm -hmm. they're not successful because they didn't get their chance or whatever the case may be. So I went ahead and I said, okay, I'm going to do this. So I started this one documentary and it it was really horribly filmed. It was just bad. Oh, no. Yeah. And so, but it offered a lot of good information. Mm -hmm. So I quit halfway through because it wasn't really talking about, like, I, I wanted a whole thing about Amy Winehouse. I didn't just want one thing about her. Like Mm -hmm. the first one, it started it and it was kind of cool because it talked about her kind of quote unquote rise to fame. And then I was like, well, this doesn't really talk about everything. So I I was trying to find the everything documentaries. So I had to go through several. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I started Back to Black, which is a documentary about her breakout album. Get this. She only had two albums. Mm-hmm. I know, well, right? Yeah, two albums. But they're incredible. So I really didn't know a lot about her other than she kind of looked like a 60s pennant musician. And I knew mm-hmm. she died young. She was part of the 27 Club, which sounds horrible. 
And I hate even saying that, but yeah. that's the club where a lot of musicians and famous people die at 27. I don't think it's really called Club 27, but a lot it's like a yeah but it's like the kurt cobain jimmy right Hendrix. exactly oh yes um, yeah and i knew that she died from some sort of overdose like something happened yeah and i and i wasn't sure what it was and like i think we are trained as humans like oh that's too bad she died of an overdose and we don't really know like the history or, or anything about why somebody dies young about something i thought well let's get to know more about amy and mm -hmm. so history about me is i love motown music like I grew up really? listening to it. Yes. Yes. I actually grew up I, with I it. I love too. it. I like, love it. I grew up with Detroit radio. And so mm. when I, even as a kid in the eighties, they still had a Motown station in Detroit yeah, because that was where too. it originated. Mm -hmm. That's not, yeah. We had it here too. And That's so this cool. is a funny thing. So when I was a kid, I want to say it was time. Time had a, a CD series. It'd be like music of 1961, 1962, oh, yeah. 1963. And I loved 1964. I stole that from my dad and yeah. I had that CD. I knew everything about that CD. I just, I loved it so much. So like I said, I grew up on Motown and Elvis. Like those were my options as a kid. Um, oh. Motown and Elvis, it was all, you know, old country. And I was like, absolutely not. Like, no. Yeah. So we always picked Motown or Elvis. And Amy loved Motown. So there's so much 60s girl band influence in her music that I just started to kind of go down the rabbit hole of like where her influence comes from. Mm -hmm. And so I had no idea she had a jazz background. Like that was what? her thing. Yes. Right. All jazz. Huh. Her first her first album was all jazz. Yeah. And it's her kind of jazz. It's not like I can sit there and say, you know, Alexa or whatever, play jazz. And it would you know, it's not yeah. like that. It's basically, it's her own. And, you know, it's it's truly yeah. her own music. Like she refused. To, one of the things she said in an interview, um, she says, I don't want my music to sound like people in the 1990s. Everything is written for them and they just sing it. Mm -hmm. And so she wanted to bring this, you know, and I think a lot of artists do that. I mean, I think you have two artists. You have the ones that want to like climb the chart and be the one, you know, like the boy bands and the people who, who yeah. sing other people's music. And then you have the real individual artists who really want to succeed in what they believe to be, you know, their. Theirs. Yeah, exactly. So she she wanted to be a jazz singer and she didn't want to compromise. And her lyrics, basically, if you look at her lyrics, they're just it's just poetry to some music that she created. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because Natalie Merchant does the same thing she did way back when. Is mm -hmm. like the the song can be upbeat and like oh this is kind of cool beat you know and you don't really listen to the words until you listen to the words and yeah. like her words are some words yeah so she she'll drop like in the middle of a song she'll say like one of the things I like what she said something about getting his dick wet in a mm -hmm. in a jazzy you know kind of a song and yeah. then she talks about fuckery a lot she sings a lot about that so. Yeah. I was, I just, I loved it. I loved actually paying attention to the words. And that, like I said, I had no real history about Amy Winehouse until I started going down this little rabbit hole about what happened to her. So I finally, I stopped watching Black, Back to Black, because it was really just about that album, which was her her one breakthrough album. And it had all yeah. the songs that we know, the rehab, the um, there's a couple others that that came out mm -hmm. that came off of that CD. So Reclaiming Amy, this documentary, and and I have no idea what the history is, where where it came from, but it feels like it's the documentary that her parents put out uh, to yeah. kind of offset the other documentaries mm -hmm. that make them look awful make them look like horrible parents yeah her parents divorced when she was like nine she was real young and mm -hmm. she even said in several of the documentaries that i watched she's like well this is you know i didn't mind it so much because i had free reign to do whatever i wanted because i knew that my mom couldn't control me you know and that's like oh, all kids no. and teenagers everybody is like that so you know she could get away with basically murder and nobody could stop her her mom had no control over her and her dad was never around. And even when he, before he left the house, mm -hmm. even then he had really, he wasn't really participating in yeah, the like kid's life. Out. Yeah, he had checked out. So her mom, so get this. Yeah. Her mother 
I'm going to try to be nice here because I know her mom's going through some stuff now. But Amy told her mother, hey, mom, I found the perfect diet. I can eat anything I want and I just puke it up. Yeah. And her mom's like, okay, that's just a phase. Just that's an eating disorder. A hundred percent it's an eating disorder. So not only was she bulimic, but she also had mental, she also like had depression. She was depressed and they knew that everybody knew she had this eating disorder and she was depressed. So between the first and second album, you know, the first album I think had some mild success and that's when she started partying like really hard. She was partying with her friends, had a good time, was like, had some relationships and uh, the drinking kind of got out of control. And so her friends and her manager found her at her apartment. Um, she had passed out. She'd hit her head, passed out drunk. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And so they're like, hey, you know, we really need to get you into rehab. We need you to uh, take care of yourself. Uh, it was like an intervention. And she goes, mm-hmm. I'll tell you what. I will go to rehab if my dad thinks that I need rehab. So they had already talked to her father before this happened, like they being her friends and her manager. Mm -hmm. And so they all get in the car and they drive over to her dad's house. Mm -hmm. And Amy goes to her dad, sits on her dad's lap, puts her arm around him. And he's like, oh, no, she doesn't need rehab. (gasps) She doesn't need. She's fine. She doesn't need rehab. So she's like, I don't need rehab. So then like her manager or producer or somebody said, you know, because she's like, no, 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 I don't need rehab. So he's like, oh, that'd be kind of a cool song. So that's where rehab comes from, the song. I mean, it literally is the story of rehab. You know, Mm -hmm. they tried to take me to rehab and I said, no, no, no. And she even talks about her dad in the song. Yeah. So that's what we're dealing with. It is awful. It is absolutely like her dad, like this whole fuck. I can't. Oh, God. You know, yeah, like and her it's so failed her, her family and her friends failed her. But in, and I mean, her friends were young and they were partiers just like her, yeah. you know, and, and even in this, this reclaiming Amy, her friends are like, you know, we knew that she had a problem, but it wasn't a problem that people talked about. Eating disorders weren't like really a problem. Everybody knew she had it. Yeah. And everybody knew that, that it was like literally like eating away at her. Yeah. Also, I don't think most people are equipped to know how to talk about it. I That's mean, true. I even remember it was quite a long while ago, but I, I took um, mental health first aid training and they tell you, they teach you what to do if someone is suicidal, but like, I don't, I don't know what you're supposed to do. Right. Like even having gotten that certification, I don't know what you're supposed to do with someone in your life has an eating disorder other than maybe try to get them to get help like right i mean they're yeah but for mom to say oh it's just a phase oh, it's well, just a phase teenage like, girls do it oh i mean that that yeah. like by the end of this documentary i was bawling yeah so they do talk about her like her relationships in life you know she her boyfriend on off again boyfriend turned husband you know he was actually the one that got her into drugs harder drugs Mm -hmm. and her dad swears that she was only into drugs for like a year and then she sobered up with Mm -hmm. the drugs but really fell into alcohol and so when she died when she passed they found three empty bottles of vodka in the room with her yeah she died of alcohol poisoning yeah she died of alcohol poisoning oh my goodness i know like uh, you know and, and it was the people who they were talking to like w- one of them was her ex-girlfriend uh i think mm-hmm. her name is katrina you know and she was asked to help like prepare the body and stuff you know the parents yeah it was hard like the whole thing was just like i said by the end of it i was bawling like oh i had God. no idea that like i just knew amy winehouse sang a couple songs sounded pretty good you know, and I thought, you know, like typical, most people think, oh, they just threw their life away. But you don't really know until you know, like the mm-hmm. struggles and everything that happened. And the parents are like, ah, oh, not our fault. You know, and they like, they get, they're in charge of her estate and like everything falls to them. And uh, the good news out of all of this is that they did open an Amy Winehouse Foundation to help people with mental problems, mental health problems. Mm. Uh, And one of the um, patients there, one of the, uh, I guess it would be a patient. She said that mental health and addiction go hand in hand. 
and that has to be addressed. They both have to be addressed, but you have to, you can't just say you have alcoholism, but there's some mental health mm-hmm. issues with that. And she said, and if it wasn't for this foundation, you know, I wouldn't be here. So there is some good that comes out of it, you know, but I feel like this documentary was really the parents and their friends trying to save face more or less. So it doesn't I sound mean, like they did the best job. They really didn't. But the- but, but the problem is, it, and if you were just to watch Reclaiming Amy, you'd be mm-hmm. like, oh my God, you know, poor them. I feel so bad for them. But right. I actually had watched several other documentaries ahead of this, you know, to make me realize where her mom yeah. said this kind of stuff. But that isn't in this documentary. But I think that is important to see because then you see the girlfriend. Like she is not mentioned in the other two documentaries Mm -hmm. uh they just talk about her tumultuous relationship with this blake guy and uh just how he seemed to be like a real gentleman but he was actually very destructive so that's a super interesting point about the nature of documentaries and where yeah if you're able it is a great idea to watch multiple about the same thing because As much as like, yeah, okay, so we've been covering a lot more documentaries on here because they're not struck work with sag But at the same time, there is a certain amount of storytelling that goes into them. There mm-hmm. is like, there is a perspective and a point of view that is put together by, right. you know, the director and whoever else is putting it together. And it's kind of reminding me of some of the George Michael mm, documentaries. Yeah, right. And because like you watched Wham!, Mm-hmm. I watched Freedom 90 and I was quite excited to watch no sorry Freedom Uncut and I was quite excited to watch Freedom Uncut especially when I realized oh this is the one that he was involved in making like he was personally involved in a couple of documentaries about his life there was that one and one that he did I don't know like a decade or more before that but there's also been like one or two documentaries that have come out after and that were made after he passed mm-hmm. and it's like well, why are they making this? And it's like, right. oh, it's his old boyfriend and it's his old manager. And mm-hmm. it's like, okay, what do these people stand to gain from it? And I haven't watched those ones, but like, I love that you watch multiples to get, to try to get to kind of that more fulsome picture. Right. Of like, I, I okay, wanted to see. Who was she actually? Mm-hmm. What actually happened to her? And it was my, you know, my love for like the whole Motown scene and, and the yeah. girl bands of the 60s. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that's great. We have that in common. And then I was like, well, this like actually propels me into to like digging deeper into her story. And mm-hmm. like I said, it was fucking sad. I just I cried at the end and, and I didn't have that reaction when it happened because I was like, oh, that's sad, yeah. you know, type thing. It was like because I didn't really know anything. And I think like the one thing about the strike is that, yes, we are seeing a lot more documentaries and I'm learning so much more about musicians and, and things of my past that I knew about, but I didn't really know in depthly. And so this is good because I'm seeing that I get, I get more mm-hmm. of a well-rounded history and that's, I mean, it's good, but it's also bad too in this situation. Well, it's sad, but also I think it's interesting because... How long ago did she die again? I know it was quite 2011. Yeah. So it's been over a decade, but like, I don't think the media helped anything and didn't treat Mm -hmm. her very well at all. And I mean, British media is like just a problem in general, but the sensationalization of her addiction Mm -hmm. and like, I don't remember the media treating much of anything about her with very much nuance and definitely not kindness Mm -hmm. it was kind of furthering just this like oh she's just a junkie oh she's just an addict right and like i think it's good to dig into some of these things so we can also interrogate okay why is this what i always believed about this Mm -hmm. person how is the media complicit in these narratives because they you know they did similar things with george michael Oh, he's just a sex addict. Oh, right. he's just, you know, he's just addicted to drugs. Oh, he's mm-hmm. just, and it's like, you watch some of these documentaries and you're like, oh, there's an incredibly sensitive person behind the story who just wanted connection, who just wanted to be loved. Right. I haven't seen it yet, but one of my best friends has been telling me about a documentary about Michael Hutchins from mm. NXS. And Ooh. he loved it if you can find that documentary apparently it's excellent not queer but and he said same thing like just 
such a tortured soul right. behind the music, such a beautiful soul. But what we hear about is the death. And right. what we hear about is the addiction. And I like, loved in excess. I mean, that was my, yeah. he was gorgeous. Oh, gorgeous yes. Man, very oh, gorgeous. Yes. Yeah. And it was just like so sad, you know, and, and you didn't back then, you didn't have the mm-hmm. internet to go look and and you didn't have the documentaries that that dug deep and you didn't have yeah. all that. You just heard that he died and he died from he hanged himself. That was yep. that was the death thing. And yeah. And but then, you know, the older you get, if you have you still have that interest, you you dig into it to find out more about it. So that's mm-hmm. that's the good thing about documentaries. But I will say this, yeah. like you, you brushed up on the uh uh, media over in England. And let me tell you, watching Beckham, I fucking hate the media in England. Even the fans, everybody is awful. Like yeah. Beckham is like one of the best soccer players ever. And like he he got kicked out of the World Cup. I think it was the World Cup and they lost and they hated him for years. They hated him for they they like ran yes. him out of England. It was yes. I, like driving they, hate to yes. sell newspapers. Ugh. Fuck you. Like that is yeah. such the moral bankruptcy of it all is so For sure. horrifying. That's kind of like, uh, what do we have here that does that? You know, the the Globe or or there used to be one. God, I forgot what it was called. Uh, it was like a bet. Yeah, because ba- yeah, you're not here. So it's like, it wasn't like the star. It was something. And it was just awful. Yeah. Like everybody. I, and there's it's just New- like, There's still the New York Post. Yeah, the New York Post. But I think now I will say this about us, about the United States. You know, I mean. You can talk about how it's skewed to the left or to the right, whatever the news is. But for the most part, mm-hmm. people are dicks to people, especially if they've, you know, they screwed up. They might say something yeah. they screwed up, but they won't like harp on it for years and years. And that's what yeah. England did, especially during like I was like, I can't go to yeah. London now because like okay, yeah. anyway, uh, that's a whole that's different the, topic. I so think that's a good thing about the U.S. media right. attention span, I think, actually kind of like works in favor. Right. In exactly. Like. And in, in a week from now, nobody's going to care about what massively just happened, you know, something. And then like a week later, it's it's yeah. gone. It's old news. So that's the yeah. good news about it. But my goodness. OK, so enough about this. What about you? What is your official recommendation this week? OK, my official recommendation this week is An Acquired Taste by Sherry Ritz. It is just this super sweet, lovely, gentle, not at all angsty sapphic nice. romance and i think you know we deliberately don't get into what's all the horrible and scary shit in the world on this podcast we want this to be joyful but i think if you know it's a hard time right now and if you just want something sweet to sink into this is such a good choice nice um so there's two lead characters ashley castle and Elbisette. Ashley has this reality show that was called Queen of the Castle. And it's kind of like her as a homemaker with her husband. But, you know, they've gotten a divorce. And so their ratings are not doing well at all. And so her agent has this amazing idea. Ashley, I'm going to get you. You're going to go on this cooking competition show and everybody's going to love you. They're going to remember that you're just the same person you've always been. And she's like, okay, okay, okay. But... Do you remember that I don't know how to cook? Nobody actually knows this. Like, this would actually be a big problem if everybody found out she didn't know how to cook. And her agent's like, whatever, we'll get somebody to teach you how to cook. But it's kind of like, can this help her retain this TV show now that, because she's also like, she's come out publicly. She is an out and proud lesbian now. So what can she do? She gets on set and Elle is there. And like, she used to have the biggest crush on Elle because you know, they were going for the same TV roles. And actually, at one point, Elle gave up this role. And that's the TV role. It was this, like, teen drama that just defined Ashley's acting career. Mm. And then, of course, from Elle's perspective, so she ended up being most famous for voicing, like, the character of some, I think, like, probably kind of like Paw Patrol-ish, I guess. Mm. And voicing kind of the female character. And there's another iteration of it coming out. And they don't hire her for it. Oh. And it's this like big kind of deal. She's a single mom and she needs to like be on TV in any capacity just to like, can I start getting gigs again? And so she ends up on this cooking competition show. And then she sees Ashley Castle there and she's fucking annoyed because Ashley stole this role from her. So like <laughs> immediately there's just this difference in like, how did this Ashley getting the role go down situation? 
but then also ashley's like super hot so she's like well <laughs> i'm mad at her but she's distracted she's hot <laughs> god damn what am i going to do <laughs> and so it's just interesting because like they have this history behind between them but they also have this chemistry and they're both competing and so now it's like okay who's going to win how are mm-hmm. we going to get from this to the happily ever after because this is a romance therefore it's not a spoiler for me to say happily ever after i like i just really loved it this is not one of those like breakup and then makeup stories there is some story there is angst to it Mm. but it's related to secondary plot lines and i thought it was interesting and there's enough of it that it keeps things super interesting i thought there would be a lot more rivalry between them on set but then of course there couldn't be as soon as i learned that ashley couldn't cook (laughs) like How can there actually be (laughs) rivalry when Elle's actually (laughs) an excellent cook and Ashley needs help and like somebody is hired to help her and it just works out like it's so cute and works out really perfectly. I quite liked how it worked with Elle as a single mom. Her daughter is a teenager. And so I think what was good is in some ways, because sometimes when kids are written into stories, they're just like sort of there as set dressing almost. Mm -hmm. No, she ends up being like a fully fledged character who has her own crush on somebody else that's competing in the show because he's a young YouTuber and like that's kind of a cute little side situation. And so the thing that's nice too is that when you get to the happily ever after, because there is a kid involved, although it's a teenager, it feels like like a family happily ever after. Good. Yeah. Which... I find really satisfying because if it's only good for the mom and it's not good for the kid, then that can be kind of like weird and squicky, but Mm -hmm. no, it's like, it's a really good one. The only thing, there's only one thing I struggled with. This was what I would call like a nearly perfect book. I'm greedy. I like perfect (laughs) books. And I don't think this is like, I'm not, I'm not saying like, don't read it as much as just there's this like big revelation that comes out in the second half. And that's uh, why I said like where kind of the angst comes from, where mm-hmm. like what's driving the tension. And it, I thought it was really interesting the way it takes Elle's version of events and throws that history up in the air. And she realizes, oh, maybe I didn't actually know everything that was happening. And I thought that was super, super interesting. And like everything fell into place there. Like it worked really well. But it was missing almost like one scene with Elle going back to the people who told her in the first place. Mm -hmm. And without knowing kind of what happens there, like, does she ever go back? I just want to know what, like, what happened? Does she never go? Does she go? Is there like a, oh, no, I feel like I need to say something to you. Like, (laughs) what is happening? So it just felt like one, it felt like there was one thread that was left dangling that i mean even if there was a short story in a newsletter i would sign up for that newsletter immediately because <laughs> hint, i just want to know yeah <laughs> come on sorry. A short story please just let us know what happened <laughs> um but it was just like it was really it was cute i love i love cooking shows cute. yeah i love reality shows in general you know i thought it was super interesting having this like we each have fundamentally different perspectives on how this big event went down i thought it was all handled really well and it was funny i went and i looked at some of the goodreads reviews because it came out i think it was released if you're in north america it was released in the summer or Mm. if you're in the southern hemisphere i suppose it was released in winter but for me it was like a lot of people (laughs) saying oh this is a perfect summer read and as I was reading it, I was thinking, oh, man, this is like a perfect fall winter read. And you just read it like <laughs> you're snuggled up with a blanket. You get some hot cocoa. Like it's So I think it's perfect any time of year that you want that kind of like gentle read with fun characters coming together. It's not going to be stressful, but you're just going to have that like warm, cozy feeling because the ending is truly perfect. Oh, nice. It's just sweet and lovely. So yes, my recommendation this week is An Acquired Taste by Sherry Ritz. Even the title is cute. Yeah, that For is like a, cute a title. foodie romance, like so good. Bravo, Sherry Ritz. It was just a fun one. I liked it quite a lot. That is all for this episode. 
If you've enjoyed the show, make sure you subscribe on your podcast app. If you have a friend that you think would like it, please pass it on to them and tell them all about it. Or if you'd like to support us, we do have the links in our show notes to our coffee and our newsletter. Or maybe if I did manage to get it together, it's going to be the Substack link this time. <laughs> we'll see how this week goes. Or if you, uh, uh, well, hell. <laughs> Aha! It's not just me. No, it's not. I just was thinking about other social media right then. So, uh, oh, or if yeah. you want to connect with us on your favorite social media sites, we have links in the show notes for that too. Or you can just search for Queerly Recommended on all the sites or email us at podcast at queerlyrecommended.com. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Also want to take a moment to give an extra special thanks to Dana, who supported us on coffee with this note that said, love your conversations. They're wise, witty, happy, filled with love for, <sighs> let's try that again. Want to take an, let's try the try again. <laughs> and, oh, it's going to be an outtake. Uh, no. For three. real, if this is, if this is an out, out, uh, God damn. I, yeah. I'm gonna take a drink. <laughs> you sound like me. <laughs> I'm going to take a drink. This is so bad. Take a For shot. real though, if this is an outtake, Dana, Dana we are so, we really are grateful. <laughs> I just can't talk today. I don't know what's happening. That's a lot. But there he is. This is embarrassing. Maybe I'm getting sick too. One of my kids is sick. Oh, jeez. <clears throat> I know, right? Well, I mean, kids are germ buckets. It's fine. <laughs>